Write section five. Ruby's story. Ivan, tell me another joke, please, Ruby begs after the two o'clock show. I think I may have run out of jokes, I admit. A story then, Ruby says. Aunt Stella's sleeping and there's nothing to do. I tap my chin. I'm trying hard to think, but when I gaze up at the food court skylight, I'm mesmerized by the elephant-colored clouds galloping past. Ruby taps her foot impatiently. I know. I'll tell you a story, she says. A real, live, true one. Good idea, I say. What's it about? It's about me, Ruby lowers her voice. It's about me and how I fell into a hole. A big hole. Humans dug it. Bob pricks his ears and joins me by the window. I always enjoy a good digging story, he says. It was a big hole full of water near a village, Ruby says. I don't know why the humans made it. Sometimes you just need to dig for the sake of digging, Bob reflects. We were looking for food, Ruby says, my family and I. But I wandered off and got lost and went too close to the village. Ruby looks at me, eyes wide. I was so scared when I fell into that hole. Of course you were, I say. I would have been scared too. Me too, Bob admits, and I like holes. The hole was huge. Ruby pokes her trunk between the bats and makes a circle in the air. Between the bars and makes a circle in the air. And guess what? She doesn't wait for an answer. The water was all the way up to my neck and I was sure I was going to die. I shudder. What happened then, I ask. I'll tell you what happened, Bob says darkly. They captured her and put her in a box and shipped her off and here she is, just like they did with Stella. He pauses to scratch an ear. Humans. Rats have bigger hearts. Roaches have kinder souls. Flies have... No, Bob, Ruby interrupts, you're wrong. These humans helped me. When they saw I was trapped, they grabbed ropes and they made loops around my neck and my tummy. The whole entire village helped, even little kids and grandmas and grandpas, and they all pulled and pulled and... Ruby stopped. Her lashes are wet, and I know she must be remembering all the terrible feelings from that day. And they saved me, she finishes in a whisper. Bob blinks. They saved you, he repeats. When I was finally out, everyone cheered. Ruby says, and the children feed me fruit. And then all those humans led me back to my family. It took the whole day to find them. No way, Bob says, still doubtful. It's true, Ruby says, every word. Of course it's true, I say. I've heard rescue stories like that before. It's Stella's voice. She sounds weary. Slowly, she makes her way over to Ruby. Humans can surprise you sometimes. An unpredictable species, Homo sapiens. Bob still looks unconvinced. But Ruby's here now, he points out. If humans are so swell, who did that to her? I sent Bob a grumpy look. Sometimes he doesn't know when to keep quiet. Ruby swallows, and I'm afraid she's going to cry. But when she speaks, her voice is strong. Bad humans killed my family, and bad humans sent me here. But that day in the hole, it was humans who saved me. Ruby leans her head on Stella's shoulder. Those humans were good. It doesn't make any sense, Bob says. I just don't understand them. I never will. You're not alone, I say. And I turn my gaze back to the racing gray clouds. A hit. Stella's foot hurt hurts too much for her to do any hard tricks for the two o'clock show. Instead, Mac pulls her, limping into the ring where, he, where she tracks a circle in the sawdust. Ruby clings to her like a shadow. Ruby's eyes go wide when Snickers jumps on Stella's back then leaps onto her head. At the four o'clock show, Stella can only get as far as the entrance to the ring. Ruby refuses to leave her side. At the seven o'clock show, Stella stays in her domain. When Mac comes for Ruby, Stella whispers something in her ear. Ruby looks at her pleadingly, but after a moment, she follows Mac to the ring. Ruby stands alone. The bright lights make her blink. She flaps her ears. She makes her tiny trumpet sound. 
the humans stop eating their popcorn. They coo. They clap. Ruby's a hit. I don't know whether to be happy or sad. Worry. When Julia arrives after the show, she brings three thick books thick books, one pencil, and something she calls magic markers. Here, Ivan, she says, and she slides two magic markers and a piece of paper into my domain. I like the sundown colors, red and purple, but I don't feel like coloring. I'm worried about Stella. All evening she's been quiet and she hasn't eaten a bit of her dinner. Julia follows my gaze. Where is Stella anyway, she asks, and she goes to Stella's gate. Ruby extends her trunk and Julia pats it. Hi, baby, she says. Is Stella all right? Stella is lying in a pile of dirty hay. Her breath is ragged. Dad, Julia calls. Could you come here a minute? George sets aside his mop. Do you think she's okay, Dad? Julia asks. Look at the way she's breathing. Can we call Mac? I think there's something really wrong. He must know about her. George rubs his chin. He always knows. But a vet costs money, Jules. Please, Julia's eyes are wet. Call him, Dad. George gazes at Stella. He puts his hands on his hips and sighs. He calls Mac. I can't hear all of his words, but I can see George's lips tighten into a grim line. Gorilla expressions and human expressions are a lot alike. Mac says the vet's coming in the morning if Stella's not any better, he tells Julia. He says he's not going to let her die on him, not after all the money he's put into her. George strokes Julia's hair. She'll be all right. She's a tough old girl. Julia sits by Stella's domain until it's time to go home. She doesn't do her homework. She doesn't even draw. The Promise My domain gleams with moonlight when I awake to the sound of Stella's calls. Ivan, Stella calls in a hoarse whisper. Ivan? I'm here, Stella. I sit up abruptly and Bob topples off my stomach. I run to the window. I can see Ruby next to Stella sleeping soundly. Ivan, I want you to promise me something, Stella says. Anything, I say. I've never asked for a promise before because promises are forever, and forever is an unusually long time, especially when you're in a cage. Domain, I correct domain, she agrees. I straighten to my full height. I promise, Stella, I say in a voice like my father's. But you haven't even heard what I'm asking yet, she says, and she closes her eyes for a moment. Her great chest shudders. I promise anyway. Stella doesn't say anything for a long time. Never mind, she says. I don't know what I was thinking. The pain is making me addled. Ruby stirs. Her trunk moves as if she's reaching for something that isn't there. When I say the words, they surprise me. You want me to take care of Ruby. Stella nods, a small gesture that makes her wince. If she could have a life that's different from mine. She needs a safe place, Ivan. Not, not here, I say. It would be easier to promise to stop eating, to stop breathing, to stop being a gorilla. I promise, Stella, I say. I promise it on my word as a silverback. Knowing. Before Mac, before Bob, even before Ruby, I know that Stella is gone. I know it the way that you know, I, wait, I know it the way you know that summer is over and winter is on its way. I just know. Stella once teased me that elephants are superior because they feel more joy and more grief than apes. Your gorilla's hearts are made of ice, Ivan, she said, her eyes glittering. Ours are made of fire. Right now, I would give all the yogurt raisins in the world for a heart made of ice. Five men. Bob heard a rat, heard from a rat, a reliable sort, that they tossed Stella's body into a garbage truck. It took five men and a forklift. 
comfort. All day I try to comfort Ruby, but what can I say? That Stella had a good and happy life? That she lived as she was meant to live? That she died with those who loved her most nearby? At least the last is true. Crying. Julia cries all evening while her father sweeps and mops and dusts and cleans the toilets. When George sees Mac, he runs to him. I can only hear a few of his words. Vet. Should have. Wrong. Mac shrugs. His shoulders droop. He leaves without a word. When George wipes the fingerprints off my glass, his cheeks are wet. He doesn't meet my eyes. The one and only Ivan. When all the humans have left, I send Bob to check on Ruby. How is she, I ask, when he returns. She was shivering, Bob says. I tried to cover her with hay, and I told her not to worry because you were going to save her. I glare at him. You told her that? You promised Stella, Bob lowers his head. I wanted to make the kid feel better. I shouldn't have made that promise, Bob. I just wanted... I point to Stella's domain, and for a moment it seems like I've forgotten how to breathe. I wanted to make Stella happy, I guess. But I can't save Ruby. I can't even save myself. I flop onto my back. The cement is always cold, but tonight it hurts. Bob leaps onto my belly. You are the one and only Ivan, he says. Mighty silverback. He licks my chin, and he's not even checking for leftovers. Say it, Bob commands. I look away. Say it, Ivan. I don't answer, so Bob licks my nose until I can't stand it any longer. I am the one and only Ivan, I mutter. And don't you ever forget it, he says. When I gaze at the food court sunlight, the moon Stella loved is shrouded in clouds. Once upon a time. All night, Ruby moans and sniffles. I pace my domain. I don't want to fall asleep in case she needs something. Ivan, Bob says gently, get some sleep, please, for your sake and for mine. Bob can't sleep unless he's on my stomach. I hear a stirring. Ivan, Ruby calls. I rush to my window. Ruby, are you all right? I miss Aunt Stella, Ruby sobs. And I miss my mom and my sisters and my aunts and my cousins, too. I know, I say, because it's all I can think of. Ruby sniffles. I can't sleep. Do you know any stories the way Aunt Stella did? Not really, I admit. Stories were Stella's specialty. Tell me a story about when you were little, Ruby pleads. She puts her trunk between the bars. Please, Ivan? I scratch the back of my head. I don't remember things, Ruby, I admit. It's true, Bob says, trying to be helpful. Ivan has a terrible memory. He's the opposite of an elephant. Ruby lets out a long, shivery breath. Oh, well, that's okay. Night, Ivan and Bob. I listen to Ruby's soft sobs for long, horrible minutes. Then I hear myself saying, Once upon a time, there was a gorilla named Ivan. And slowly and deliberately, I try to remember. The Grunt I was born in a place humans call Central Africa, in a dense rainforest so beautiful no crayons could ever do it justice. Gorillas don't name their newborns right away the way humans do. We get to know our babies first. We wait to see hints of what might yet be of what might yet be. When they saw how much she loved to chase me around the forest, my parents decided on my twin sister's name, Tag. Oh, how I loved to play Tag with my sister. She was nimble, but when I got too close, she would leap onto my unsuspecting father. Then I would join her, and we would bounce on that tolerant belly until he gave us the grunt, the rooting pig sound that meant, Enough! That game never got old. 
although my father might have disagreed. Mud. It didn't take long for my parents to find my name. All day long, every day, I made pictures. I drew on rocks and bark and my poor mother's back. I used the sap from leaves. I used the juice from fruit, but mostly I used mud. And that is what they called me, mud. To a human, mud might not sound like much, but to me, it was everything.